Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a, a framework for cloud IT and business uh, transformation. You guys are in the right place. We have a, a really incredible um, treat for you today. Uh, I know that some of you are thinking about the happy hour that's coming up uh, and that there's probably going to be a vacuum about 4.30 at the end of this thing for everyone moving out. Um, but I encourage you right now, start thinking about some questions that you have. Um, there is an incredible amount of talent on the stage here today, experience um, in, in running IT, in thinking about IT, and um, both of the, the speakers here today are just um, are fabulous. So um, I'm going to ask you, at the end of the session, we have allocated some time for Q&A uh, for you know, folks who want, have some questions that you want to kind of kick around, some ideas, um, and we do invite the interaction. So be thinking about that, and then if you want to at the end, um, there'll be an opportunity to come up and um, you know, waste your, your happy hour time with us. Uh, so my name is Blake Chisholm. I work for AWS. Um, I lead the professional services team that works uh, vertically in state, local education, and education technology across the country. Um, I'm going to let our, our panelists um, kind of spend a couple minutes talking about who they are, um, their organization, and then we're going to have a, a back and forth uh, dialogue here. And um, I, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's going to be a real treat. Um, I sort of had a vision for how this would go, and we got on the phone. They started talking, and it was electric. Um, it was incredible, just the ideas going back and forth. We blew up the other ideas and are going with this. And um, I think that you'll, you'll get rewarded for for coming through this. So Beth Ann, if you would introduce yourself and kind of talk about your, um, your organization. OK, great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. My name is Beth Ann Bergsmark. I work at Georgetown University. I'm the interim deputy CIO and assistant vice president chief enterprise architect, which, which is a lot of words there. I've worked at Georgetown for 20 years and actually started my career in IT teaching science faculty what this new thing called the World Wide Web was and whether or not that would really catch on. Uh, and in my 20 years of technology, I think that this is the most exciting time for technology that, that I've seen in a long time. So, oh, sorry, a little bit better. Uh, the transformations going on now in terms of cloud, social, mobile, open, are giving us an opportunity to move at a faster pace, to embrace innovation, to do new things, and completely reinvent our organizations and align better to the business. You know, at Georgetown, our modernization strategy isn't just about upgrading old systems. It's about changing the way we do business, building new partnerships with the community, and working towards this vision of a campus that embraces innovation. Cloud has been a critical component of this. And in the beginning, I think we really thought the primary driver would be cost savings. What we've learned along the way is that it's truly the agility and the innovation and the opportunity to change paths is where the true value in cloud has, has, has been for us in our environment. We've learned that the traditional IT models of shrink wrap software with heavy customizations, where when you launch on day one, you're already impeded from making any innovations or changes, sunk costs in capital infrastructure, or having budgets and resources aligned where 90% of your spend is just on running the trains, doesn't give you any opportunity to keep up and grow. About three years ago, you know, at Georgetown, we were facing a scenario where our technology stacks were aging across every layer, across every domain. We had a flat declining budget. We were spending all of our dollars just running the trains, and we were looking at maintenance costs that were soaring at the same time the value we were delivering to the business was declining. So we really had to look at a new way of doing things. We've replaced seven major systems in three years on a flat budget, and honestly, the only way we did that was by driving efficiencies in certain areas, removing legacy systems, really tackling that issue of legacy debt so we could reinvest those dollars back into the IT environment, leveraging the cloud technologies to bring more service to our community. And when you think of higher ed, it's probably the last thing you think about is some, you know, moving fast, radical change, and you know, especially a place like Georgetown where we start every introduction with the oldest Jesuit Catholic institution in the country founded in 1789. You don't really connect to innovation, but if you look across our campus and you see the 18 to 22 year olds, you see the energy, the expectation that they have, that their university and their educational environment will mirror their expectations for what they see in the consumer world and what they hope to deliver in the workforce. You know, you'll find that you know, higher ed can be you know, a true bed of innovation in those areas. Um, 
Part of our success has been in part to the partners that we have found, and we've found that when we're aligning with companies like Amazon and others that are truly changing the game, we can, I don't want to use the word inflict, we can introduce change to our communities in a way where they will not only accept it, but they'll embrace it. Because at the end of the day, they're getting more than they had in the beginning. And we're in a better position as things change to not be sunk in for 10 years. So we can respond to those rapid changes in all of our, that I think all of our industries are experiencing. So I'm really excited to be here and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the business drivers, the economic models, and how we're working that across education, research, and administrative computing. Great, Bethan, thank you so much. Thank you much. Uh, Chris Trinconi. Hi, I'm Chris. <laughs> My name is Chris Cinconi. I'm the CIO for the city of McKinney, Texas. Uh, McKinney, Texas is about 15 miles north of Dallas, and we started a transformation about five years ago that's pretty exciting. About uh, five years ago, I, I took over, and like probably most small to mid-sized cities, we had a data center in the basement that turned into what we called the Cyber Aquaplex. Uh, I had a flood above it, and... Uh, that was about the beginning of all this, so we moved to a private cloud and uh, started modernizing that way. About a year ago, we started looking into Amazon. Uh, I kind of had this epiphany that I think that um, having your own infrastructure is kind of like owning your own power plant just because you use, use electricity. So what we did is we started moving down uh, the road and working with AWS services to uh, start moving our infrastructure off. Our goal is to be the first city of our size to be all in. And uh, we're working at it day by day, and uh, it's been a good experience working with AWS right now. I like that goal. I think more people should, uh, should take that on, yeah. Um, but before we get into this, I want to just pull the audience a little bit. I think it, it's kind of important. How many of you are in, in organizations that are just kicking the tires, that, that are sort of at the very beginning of, of thinking about cloud and moving into it? Okay, maybe 10%. Um, how many of you are in the middle of, I know you're not. <laughs> how, how many of you are, are sort of in the middle of this process? You're, you're, you're having to come up with the business case and the, you know, the reference architectures and all that. Okay, a couple more. Um, and how many are just all in? You're, you're off to the races and, and kind of, okay. And the rest of you, not sure why you're here. <laughs> Great. It's a means to an end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, good. Well, um, so, so Beth Ann, you had mentioned that the, the business drivers primarily revolved around cost. And initially, that's sort of the, the perception. Well, the only reason anybody would move to the cloud is just because it's cheaper, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of times that may or may not make sense for an organization. So what, what have you seen at Georgetown that are some of the business drivers that, that you have? Well, um, I think alignment is... I'm not sure. Can, can, can you hear me? No. no. There it goes. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. I used to teach, so I, I'll see if I can get to the back of the room without the mic. Uh, alignment is, is one business driver. What we're seeing in our research environments is that the traditional research uh, funding model is from grant cycles, and grant cycles are not 10-year, 15-year, 20-year cycles. We generally have a funding stream for a set period of time where researchers and scientists, uh, they need X amount of resources to run the workload and analyze the data. In our traditional CapEx environment, it would be very difficult. Let's say a researcher comes to me and says, I need 1,000 cores to do something in an HPC environment, and my on-premise environment only has 500 cores. I have to start engaging in a long, drawn-out conversation about whether they have the capital funds, can we engineer, can we design this, and then six months later, have we gotten anywhere? In the cloud environments, if a researcher has an idea where they need a thousand cores, they can spin that up in the cloud. And what we're hearing from a lot of the agencies is that they're really looking at aligning those grants against the cloud environments. And so from, a, from an educational standpoint, that's something what we have to go there, whether we want to or not. We've also seen drivers in innovation. A lot of times in the past, you know, we, we didn't really want to experiment. We didn't want to fail forward fast or try something out because it was a long engineering process, we'd have to allocate resources, the costs were sunk, whereas now on the cloud, you know, we can try things out. We can see what resonates, we can see what sticks. 
uh, we could be much more open to our community. It's giving us an opportunity as an organization to really attack that perception of central IT. If you come to them, it's going to take a long time and they're going to charge you a million dollars and you may not like what you get in the end. What the cloud has really given us is for us to be a true partner, to add value with zero latency. And I think that that's a lot of what our business users are looking for. Excellent. What about for you, Chris? I think for us, uh, our business model is a little bit different than probably higher ed. Um, I can't just invent new revenue of being a city. And we have certain organizations that see fees as an alternative form of tax. Yet citizens want more and more services. So there's some type of, a, there's a dichotomy that goes on there that you, you have to try to balance. One of the big advantages I saw with, with, with the CapEx OpEx cycle is that if I, could reduce, if I could take the CapEx and return it back to the general fund, I could allow public safety, uh, roads, to have a little bit more money to do the things that they normally couldn't do in the past. Some of the savings based upon our projected uh, comparisons, uh, year one were somewhere between around 38%. We're doing in a three year phase up to 56%. Um, over having our traditional private cloud and uh, on-premise infrastructure that we have in place today. So I, I think that if what, what's important for us is to try to, instead of competing with the businesses that, that give services to our constituents, that we are going to help the departments help the constituents more effectively. Yeah, so that, that CapEx to OpEx is, is, is one of the treats that I think I was talking about. You know, we, we sort of understand the radical nature of cloud as the, a disruptive uh, technology. But, you know, discussing CapEx to OpEx as a way of running your IT environment is, is, is pretty radical as well. So it's kind of creating this, this, you know, this notion that we have to rethink everything about the way that we, we do IT. Um, what would that CapEx to OpEx model look like? Well, in, in our environment, and actually let, let me uh, preface this where I think one of the real values are to the IT providers in moving from the CapEx to the OpEx model. And I don't know if any of you have been in this situation that in the traditional on-prem is when you get to end of life and replacement of that system is dependent on CapEx. And has anybody been in the situation where you have not had access to the CapEx when the system needed to be replaced? Really? Wow, I want to work for government. Okay. <laughs> no. so, so in higher ed, we'll also run into the situation where we don't necessarily have the funds at that point in time to do a large scale replacement. And then you live beyond the life of a particular system. That creates security issues, it creates customer issues as things start to degrade. It's a very painful process and you're always sort of running up to that precipice where you may fall off if you don't have the influx of capital. And to Chris's point, you know, we're competing with buildings, we're competing with public safety. And when there are too many needs for that limited pool of CapEx, what do you do? In the OpEx model, you have a steadier path where you're really paying as you go. And in the cloud-based services, whether it's software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, that stack is also carrying you forward. Now, for some organizations, that's bad because I can't continue to run software that's no longer under maintenance, out of date, can't be patched, is 25 years old. But that's actually a very good thing from a security standpoint, from a functional standpoint, and from a predictability standpoint. Where we're seeing the most challenges in moving from CapEx to OpEx is actually more about the consumption-based model, where in a lot of financial planning, uh, finance officers almost would rather see more and have it be predictable than to say, well, it might be our range and that there's more risk involved. And we're seeing that play out through the organization. Where in the past, on-premise CapEx model was very pr forgiving. You know, I would build it to the t top peak. It might have been inefficient, but I'm pretty safe. I can have some, you know, some application inefficiencies, some things can go wrong, nobody's going to notice. In the cloud-based environments, you've got to be actively managing those workloads. DevOps engineering becomes really critical, or you see at an economic level, you see that bill go up. So you're highly incentivized to start to manage that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another shift. Yeah, I, I don't know if any of you experience this as well, but uh, your customers um, typically don't know how much it costs to run IT. And they like to complain quite a bit, but they don't know how much it costs. One thing that we noticed with moving to uh, AWS is that we have we have a per drink model that we're building. So basically, if they just want 10 terabytes of magical data, 
they're going to pay for 10 terabytes of magical data, which is a little bit different than, than it was in the past. I think, th I think the CapEx, OpEx whole discussion is relevant to, to your organization, though, um, and unique to your organization as well. Because, uh, like, for instance, in, in our organization, that one model of storage, uh, just about everything that you have to do, you have to retain data, uh, at least on video anymore. So um, that th those costs are going through the roof. Well, there's no funding sources. And then we have a lot of unfunded mandates that come down from the state that says, thou shall do this, but there's no way to come up with funding for that. So I think that um, that's what's unique to our environment with, re with regard to the CapEx OpEx model. But in smaller to mid-sized organizations too, you know, you don't typically have test development environment. So this gives us the opportunity to uh, allow us to stand up a test and development environment and only turn it on when we're going to use it rather than trying to find old servers to see if we could get it to work on there or if we could just uh, out of the blue uh, magically see if we could uh, break it before we put it into production. We're experiencing the exact same thing and also one of the things that we realized as we've been going through the work with Amazon on really understanding the total cost of ownership in our on-prem environment, it's really opened our eyes on how opaque that actually is and how we really don't have a good understanding of what our costs are over time and the idea of sort of build it and then something stays forever, you know, creates a significant amount of legacy debt that, w that we don't track in our financial models. So one of the things that we're looking at as part of our cloud transformation is using it as an opportunity to redo our funding models with our campus community and sort of separating things out. I mean, in the past we've commingled between research, academic, departmental, enterprise, innovation, and experimental all on one stack and it's been very difficult to understand in terms of who's allocated to do what. So using this as an opportunity to find models that make sense for each of those environments. And so it seems like the, the, the current purchasing model is based on, let's call it an annual budget, right? And so when you go to, to buy something, you buy it and pay for it. Um, as we're looking in the future on the cloud, part of the benefits are you're able to spin up services and use them when needed and then turn them off. So a workload could be a three months worth of use in a given year. It could be a year and a half. Um, you know, maybe you optimize it, maybe you change it and do something different with it and you quit using it when it's done. Um, is there a path to sort of incorporating that sort of pay for what you use type of model on cloud computing and, and then being able to adjust your, your current funding model where you're sort of tied to the fiscal year? I guess it depends on what model you use, right? Right now we're starting off phase one with um, the per hour uh, billing model from Amazon, but then we could actually move into an environment where we could say, okay, we're gonna dedicate X amount of dollars or we, we, we know we're gonna need these services in the future in which the pricing comes down. I think that the, the, the per drink model for at least us is going is important because I could incorporate it uh, into a five year TCO um, with every project that I put into place, but then I could also back charge my um, well, back charge is a bad word in the government, right? So show back how much storage space is increased and things of that sort, which you don't typically have the resources to do when it's on an on prem environment, but. Um, I think from a funding point of view, um, it's gonna, I don't, I don't know. I think it's gonna be something that the organization needs to learn how we're gonna handle moving forward into what I call this next oil boom, this X as a service moving forward because uh, I think there's a lot of things that are gonna have to change. Um, I think that uh, careers will change. I think that uh, funding models will change. I think opportunities will change. I think that uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a really unique time moving forward that uh, into the future that uh, I don't know if we're all prepared for the fallout that's coming along with it. Yeah. And what are some of the challenges that you see in, in sort of predicting what your future charges are going to be? Um, you know, we know with, um, you know, different services and tools and things like that, now you can purchase them once for three years. Um, what are some ways that you're planning for the future when it comes to, to procurement? I think we're, th we're thinking along two lines, and again, you know, in, in higher education, we have a, 
we don't necessarily have a top-down environment. So from central IT, we can decide to go do something and 60% of our community could on a given day decide to do something else. And we've had phenomenal success over the past three years in you know, what we characterize as unification and consolidation, where there's true value there. When we're thinking about sort of that predictive cost, one of the things we think about in higher ed are the dollars that are flowing out of the university really in an unplanned manner. And a lot of higher ed institutions right now, there's a huge amount of Amazon spend going on that nobody in, in central IT knows about. And in fact, sometimes the finance department doesn't know about it either because these are very small charges. They're done off of brokers, they're done off of research or grants. And we're not necessarily optimizing where we should be optimizing in all the environments. So I think that one of the things we're looking at is sort of at a central level, without impeding, without slowing things down, trying to get situational awareness in terms of who's doing what and who needs to do what in the cloud, how can we help optimize that with predictive modeling? And also thinking about building safety nets for your organization too. You know, whether we can use some of the tools and technology to build sort of gate thresholds, whether that's a warning or that stops somebody before they go up off the rails. Thinking more in terms of funding ranges rather than set amounts. Um, and then building different models for things that would be experimental to enterprise to others. I mean, I think there is a way, that in many other areas, whether it's software as a service and platform as a service, it's not a complete guessing game. I mean, you, you do buy into a certain amount for a period of time. You're just working under ranges and thresholds, and if you go over that, you can agree to additional charges. So. Okay. I, I think this is a perfect example of what I was saying before, is that everything is unique to your environment. You know, some organizations out there have a distributed model. Some have a collaborative model. And, you know, it, it, it's very hard for you to determine what's going to work for you until you start going down that path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for our environment, if I were to leave departments the opportunity to pay for maintenance, let's say, on their own applications, uh, very few times would they pay for the maintenance on their application. Something else would come first. So I think that in this particular case with moving to this, they're, they're almost forced into a model where this is the cost of doing business, this is the way you need to move forward, and then everything else on top of it is uh, things that they get for their, their budget items. I think there's also a significant opportunity for us down the road to have more choice and more flexibility when we do hit those hard times, when we do hit budget cuts. Because right now when we're dealing with environments with sunk infrastructure cost, you know, at the software application layer, a new vendor may emerge that provides better software, cheaper, faster, meets my needs better, but I've already sunk all this money into the infrastructure and if that new application doesn't align to what I had before, it doesn't necessarily scale, or I want to keep it because I'm locked into a heavy shrink wrap maintenance contract. So I want something to live for longer than it really should. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that at the business level right now, you, you really can't think of, you know, with the exception of a few ERPs, a lot of the software, you're not thinking of it in terms of 10, 15 years anymore. You're thinking in terms of two to three. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, you know, an, an, another piece of, of the cost perspective is, is people, right? So you have to have people who are are going to be running this infrastructure. There are costs associated with, with hiring people, with training them, retraining for a cloud, cloud optimization. So um, talk a little bit about you know, the, the process that you see the people model undergoing in terms of, of retooling your staff, uh, bringing in additional resources, whatever that may be, and then you know, sort of speculate out. What, what does that look like in three years? What does the, you know, the all-in on AWS people model look like? Well, I think you start with hiring a cloud therapist for your organization. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, you know, what's, what's been fascinating to me is that in our modernization, you know, we had a very fast move to software as a service. Platform as a service wasn't that controversial. But, you know, we've had the most concern regarding infrastructure as a service, where that is the area that is truly giving a really exciting job and career path to many of our technologists that worked within the systems. I think that for many of our technical staff, we've done them a disservice over the past 10 years where we forced them into levels of specialization. You know, the training and the skills that we've sent them to have been product-based. You know, we've got, you know, the VM specialist, the block storage specialist, the F, you know, F5 specialist. Um, and they're so siloed now that we've almost boxed them in from a world where they can abstractly think up and down the stack. I think the new IT go-to guy is really somebody who's an agile athlete 
that could abstractly think up and down the stack. They understand what the applications require so they can dynamically spin that workload. They understand predictive modeling. They understand DevOps engineering. And I think that's a really exciting path for them. I think in terms of engaging your staff, you know, we're, we're doing this sort of twofold. One, you know, really focusing new hires, looking for those types of skills, those demonstrated skill sets. And for a number of our staff members who have the ability to and the interest to go there, you know, casting a wider net across the organization to provide the training and to work with them to help them get to, the, to these uh, skill sets and this new way of thinking. I agree with the cloud therapist point. It uh, is a very, very difficult transformation for some people. I think over the years, people have learned to uh, have bought badges, like you said, a VM badge, an EMC badge, all the way down the line. And it makes it very hard for them to move out of that camp, depending on where they are in their career especially. So it becomes very, very challenging and very, very difficult to transform somebody that might have been in the virtualization world for the last 15 years into this world where all of a sudden they don't know where their servers are at or they don't know where their, 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 how the infrastructure works and they don't really care to know it. So I think that a lot of, the, a lot of it is, is a lot of inclocation, sitting there and repeating the same message. Um, I have found that um, I've had a little bit of an opportunity the last five years to transform the organization and a little bit more into what I believe IT will be in the future, which is more right-brained. I think you're gonna see a lot of business intelligence, a lot of data analytics. You're gonna see a lot of um, those type of skill sets really start to propagate into the industry. And I think one way or another, IT is becoming almost a, an application or development-centric organization. And I think that scares staff to some extent. If you peruse through AWS, you know, you see Python and Ruby and Java and Node.js and the templates are all written in that and the interaction and the APIs and all that kind of stuff. I think it sometimes scares the traditional IT person that's not familiar with it. You know, I had a hard enough time some, you know, getting my people to move the PowerShell right at one time. And now all of a sudden we're asking them to, to learn these application languages and, you know, and it's not AWS and it's not any other organization. It's just the way the industry is moving. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's scary. I think it, uh, you have to kind of hold their hand a little bit. And I think that you have to stay true to your vision and mission. And if your vision is that you believe that the, the world's going to move forward in this type of an environment, then you got to stay true to it and keep on, and keep on pushing through because uh, they will try to wear you down. And you also have staff, at least I do, that uh, have supported me and supported this mission, and they're all in as well. So it's you know it takes time, but that's kind of, I, th I think that's where we're, we're kind of caught up right now in between the two. Uh, to answer the rest of your question, where do I see it in the future? Mm -hmm. I see IT organizations as being more application centric. I think that uh, either system integration or I see application integration, or I see, um, you know, um, like I think you brought up before, just a, a holistic view of how, you know, the, how the technology works to accomplish the business objective. Excellent. I concur. I mean, uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings of my staff is that the future is going to come whether we want it to or not. I mean, there are some things that are outside our realm of we're going to decide and, you know, cut Georgetown off from the rest of the world. Um, you know, trying to share that information that many of us might have more access to in terms of, you know, down the road, we, we know that our ERP applications are going to software as a service. They can't compete. They can't stay in business doing shrink wrap. You know, there's going to be fewer and fewer of those traditional things, transactional things riding on our infrastructure. Whereas what we're seeing the prototypes and the new applications emerge really in these cloud-based environments that there's an inevitability to it. I think there's a lot of positive to it, but you know, sharing that with your staff I think is important. Um, the second is that I actually don't agree that IT is becoming a right-brained world. I think one of the challenges that we really need to realize is that within our IT organizations, that deep technical knowledge, that ability to build the mental model, the abstraction across the stack is really critical. Because as we're seeing multiple cloud environments, there's lots of buzzwords, portability, hybrid architectures, you know, 
trying to really understand what that means, where to position, how to build those environments or broker those environments, how to understand what the vendors are giving you. I mean, I've seen that in our own application areas that have moved to software as a service where now, I mean, I've got some phenomenal solution architects, business analysts, but they are completely divorced from understanding resource allocation, what is actually going on. When there's a problem with the vendor, you're a little bit at the vendor's mercy. It's been really helpful to really have those hardcore IT staff to say, oh, database lock issue, and I, I can push back on my vendor. So I think it's a balance. I mean, and what we're doing is we're rebalancing our organization. And again, going back to that idea of the agile athlete, I mean, I would love to see, you know, especially in higher ed, for us to come out with a workforce that has that strong left brain analytical skill to understand the complexity at the same time, the right brain skills to think holistically to connect and communicate with the business. Yeah, and, and lastly, I'd, uh, you know, when you think about space exploration, you know, in the middle of the last century, um, you know, not only were, you know, NASA and, and other agencies, you know, sort of inventing and creating for the sake of space exploration, but it also spawned a lot of other innovations in society in general whether it's materials or processes or different things like that that came out of that. Um, what are some things that you see that cloud computing is providing in terms of innovation, um, either within the technology itself or just within your organization? What are some opportunities um, for innovation that are coming out of this? Well, our, our core mission is, is, is not central IT. Our core mission of Georgetown is educating students, academics, and research. And I think cloud offers, especially AWS, some phenomenal opportunities. I mean, we're seeing in our business school courses being taught in terms of how to develop a startup, how to develop a new company. And we've seen students go out on their own to get for Amazon and then start a startup after they leave. That, you know, their experience with us during those four years needs to be as much about them understanding how to become a producer as a consumer of their education. And we can help guide them and create these safe environments, these beta environments, for them to play out these ideas. You know, one of, one of the groups that we have at Georgetown I think is phenomenal is uh, uh, G Women Coders. And these are 400 students have signed up for this over the past two years. And they're coming on Saturdays on their own time to learn Python, learn coding. And 98% of them are not computer science majors. They're not the hardcore techies at all. But they're really looking in terms of how can I use technology to solve global problems, to solve the problems in my discipline. And using the cloud technologies, it's giving them an entry. It's removing those barriers that can help in the business environments, building the pipeline of science, young scientists, you know, giving access at levels we've never seen before and that we can really leverage that. I think for us it gives us a competitive advantage with the private sector. Um, one of the biggest complaints that I have is like, for instance, why doesn't your bill pay look like Chase? Because there's really no competitive advantage to do so, to spend $80,000 or $100,000 on a bill pay portal. Um, it's important, yes, but is it the, would you be able to, you still have to collect your money one way or another when you're a city. I think that it'll allow us to, to move into more mobile environments as well. This next generation is uh, almost entirely mobile centric. Um, I think that we're still trying to learn what this next generation is and, and uh, what they're becoming. Uh, on my way down, I was listening to uh, in between teenagers fight the whole way. Uh, for 19 hours. I was listening to uh, one of the serious stations and they did a study, I, I don't want to say a thousand teenagers from the ages of 13 to 18 and they asked them what are the top 10 celebrities you know and 60 percent of the celebrities were Vine and YouTube celebrities where you know, in traditional times, they would have you know pulled movie stars out, and now they're using that. This whole culture is changing, and, and how they think and how they operate. So, I think that that would help. That helps us out quite a bit. Um, the, you know, for instance, uh, I have one generation that wants bill pay, and then I have a whole other generation now that wants to pay by phone. So it gives me some leverage and gives me the ability to move quicker. I think than than I could in the past. 
No, I, th I think that's a critical point because in central IT, if we can lower the co amount of dollars that we spend on just running the organization, then we actually have more flexibility when our business users want to transform things. And we're on this precipice, I mean, with the Internet of Things and the extraordinary things that are coming out in terms of smart cities, smart campuses, where we really want to go there. But if we don't change the way we've been doing the old stuff, we have no flexibility to do that. Perfect. Um, so I'd like to spend the, the next few minutes doing a kind of a question and answer, um, allowing you know you and the audience to, to ask a question of the panelists and um, kind of go back and forth. Uh, right here on the third row, Mike Drill has a microphone, so if you raise your hand, he can uh, pass it to you. Hi, I'm Lori Johnson uh, from Uplift Education in Dallas, Texas, so very familiar with McKinney. Um, I was hoping you guys could talk a little bit about the transformation kind of life cycle, whether it sounds like, Chris, with the flood, it was kind of an all-in. Um, but Bethann, for you, if it was something that you moved more slowly, I think where we're challenged is um, trying to move our database to a cloud environment, our data warehouse, but whether we also move our source systems there at the same time. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about your process. Which one? Both. I'll start with her. Okay. <laughs> Oops. All right. So, so we, we started down our road, and actually our first place was honestly Google email, Google Calendar. Uh, and uh, we found that 50% of my faculty and students were already there. So, I mean, it, it was our choice, but it was a, a driven choice uh, from our community. Uh, and it was just a phenomenal experience in terms of our community for once, first time I've ever seen the campus do this, unite on one system across all campuses, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. Fantastic experience. Um, our second move was really into Workday, which was for our HR and financials moving into the cloud. And again, very transformational experience. You know, we were no longer spending money on customization. We're moving into configuration management. We're, do we're delivering a lot more to the business by moving down that road. In terms of now, how do you move those other things that are on-premise? Do you move them to infrastructure as a service? Do you move them to software as a service? The way we're approaching that is sort of is twofold. Um, we're working with a number of partners, AWS Professional Services, Day One. We've also worked with Cycle Computing in the research environment, where we're going through a few full inventory and assessment of our data center to understand, one, what are the dependencies between the different applications? And amazingly, you usually don't know that until you start looking for that. So we can understand what those groupings are. And then we're plotting it out on a course for when we predict we'll either have the next software system replacement and whether or not that's going to go to software as a service. So a good example, my learning management system, I really can predict within you know, two to three years that's going to be software as a service. So that's something that I might leave you know, on my legacy infrastructure if it's going to be there for three years. Whereas other things that I might predict being out 10 years move to infrastructure as a service. So I think that that grouping is key and that finding a partner that can help you do that assessment so you can understand what's there. I think that the other aspect of that is that we're finding when we go through you know, our 800 VMs, what is everything that's out there? I mean, there's a lot of legacy things out there that probably shouldn't be there or that we could shut down. Is this an opportunity to drive some more efficiency to re-engage some of those stakeholders that may have built something 10 years ago and, and it's still sitting out there? I think for us, certainly uh, the Cyber Aquatic Center uh, definitely started our uh, voyage moving forward into, um, into the cloud. But I think it was just uh, cost where we there, there had to be a better way to do this. Um, managing drivers, managing infrastructure, gr grow, a growing organization. I think McKinney is scheduled to grow out to about 350,000 people over the next 10 years. Um, we're at about 160,000 now. So, you know, how do you keep up with that growth and keep up with uh, the demand at the same time. So I think that helped us. We're doing it in a three-phase approach though. Right now we kind of forklift, would you say forklift upgraded our environment. So we have virtual firewalls that mimicked our regular firewalls. We, we're moving our, our, infrastructure, our, our servers over wherever we can. We're leveraging some of the technology to, to move things to, EC, or to S3 and start tiering uh, using Glacier to some extent. I think that the next phase, what we're going to do is we're going to start taking advantage of templates and some of that coding we talked about to try to drive some other efficiencies. Uh, some of the new projects that we're moving forward with, we use those because, for instance, uh, we're putting a new enterprise class system in where 
you know, we set the, uh, a load balancer to tell us, okay, you know, traditionally we would have bought this super huge piece of infrastructure or, or created this large VM infrastructure to, to run this application that might, if you average it out over 24 hours, used about 11% of it. Where now we're using very small micro instances and the load balancer will scale up and down depending on user demand. So I could shut off things during the night or I could turn things off when they're not being used and it automatically happens. So that, that's kind of phase two. And then phase three would be just to kind of completely do a sweep of the whole entire environment and try to um, you know, and take advantage of more of the application or the programming side of the infrastructure that comes out. And, and I'll, I'll tell you for, for AWS and, and professional services, we work with you know, organizations of, of all shapes and sizes across the country and around the world. And the, the technology is the easiest part of transformation. So we know, everybody knows how to move the technology. And in fact, you could hire an army of people to come in and move all of your stuff overnight or over a couple of days and it would be up and running. It, it's the people in process that really take a lot of work to get that transformation to happen. That's where your planning um, needs to happen ahead of time. So, you know, Chris mentioned a lot about, you know, kind of the phases, whether you're lifting and shifting and, um, you know, whether you're having to re-platform and all of that. So you, you kind of have these parallel work streams on transformation that have to do with the migration of workloads, when it makes sense, when it makes financial sense. The, the other piece is, is people, as we talked about. You know, how do you get the training and skill set for your staff? If you're gonna be bringing in resources, what are the appropriate levels? Um, but from the, the, the technology standpoint itself, the security, all of the um, perceived major issues, they're, they're not. You know, we, we have those documented um, you know, cases of how to do that but it's really getting the, the people in process on board with what makes sense for your organization. Well, one, one thing that I think is, a, oh, sorry, the, another important consideration is um, I think a lot of organizations struggle with uh, the issue of timing. I know Georgetown, that's something that we have debated internally where you, know, you may be an organization where you're looking at an end of life in your data center, you could, you could save money immediately if you shut it down where you're highly incentivized to do a very accelerated all-in path. And I, honestly, I, th I think those are sometimes the better course of action because when you're really focused, it's a lot easier to get something big done. However, for organizations where you have our, you've made a recent large investment, you don't want to throw that out the window, or you're locked, maybe you're locked into a co-location agreement, I think it's just as important to start thinking of pathways into the cloud and the public cloud, because I, not all cloud out there is that cloudy. Uh, because if you don't, you're losing the, your positioning power and you create this never-ending cycle. So uh, one of the things that we've been looking at for the past year is that, you know, put a moratorium on sinking more capital into an environment we know is not the future. So can I spin off workloads to give myself more headroom so I don't need to grow those environments that I know are going to be legacy soon? And I think that there's pathways with that. And then, then that also helps you, it gives your staff time to learn the methodologies, to learn the skills. And while I agree with Blake that the technology is out there and everybody knows how to use it, it's the processes and the mental model and creating the how do I make that part of my day-to-day -day activity mm -hmm. that's very tricky. And there's a lot of change in terms of the APIs and the tool sets that are out there that are very new to staff, where I think that's where the real challenge is. I think that uh, by moving, doing the lift and shift, it kind of allows you to grow it from the outside in as well. Because I think sometimes it's hard to get your head around this whole public cloud thing and the whole AWS thing. So I think that by doing the lift and shift and you kind of mimic your environment today there, and then you slowly start to pull in and say, okay, we're no longer going to use the firewalls we used. We're going to use AWS's firewalls. Or we're no longer going to do it this way. We're going to do it this way. And you slowly create little challenges within there. I think it helps with what we talked about staff adoption as well. Because um, that, that definitely helped out quite a bit when we moved into, uh, as, as we're moving into this environment as well. Uh, we've got time for one more. And I saw a hand right here. You yeah, just kind of reach back. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you. And thank you very much. <clears throat> when I hear the two of you, the difference that I hear is the education and the government. I had the, the government, uh, I've been to your city, 
in McKinney. I almost bought it. I was caught many, many years ago over there. <clears throat> but this is the key question that I have for you. When we're talking about the future, uh, Chris, there are some uh, children, young people, that will be needed to raise what we call the IT uh, uh, subject that we're talking about and the cloud system. What is the government doing in a city like yours to help the young people to be able to get to that place so that the job market in your area will not go, the, the kids will not go somewhere else for the job market and you'll be able to help them? Because we are having a lot of problem in our hands with the kids that are coming up today. And the question to you was that, uh, being an educator, uh, I've seen some colleges and some universities that partners with the, uh, with the city or the government to be able to train so many young people in this area. What is uh, Georgetown or some other university around you, the people that you meet or fellowship with, what are they doing to be able to partner with the city in order to bring this either high school, college student into this uh, cloud business so that they can be able to be useful for the future that we're talking about? Wow. I think that was a great question. I think that, uh, I think that geographical boundaries are, have already been challenged. I think people live in, or, in areas because they like it. But I think in the future, people will, will live where they want to live, but they will work anywhere. And I think that that's where the cloud, especially the public cloud, is really moving in, in, into, uh, into this next generation's um, education base. So with George, uh, Georgetown, I mean, you know, being a Jesuit institution, service is part of our core mission. Uh, as well as being in an urban environment, we have lots of opportunities where we partner with DC schools, we partner with schools that focus on at-risk students. And actually, I have a wonderful story about one of the students who is an intern in our organization. Um, uh, I won't share her first name, but she's 14 years old. She's uh, at high risk, uh, but she's part of a program that takes high-risk students and then it has a 98% high school graduation rate at the end. Uh, she sat down with both myself and my former CIO to talk about her experience working in our group, you know, building Drupal sites. And she said, I have always dreamed that someday I will have a job working with computers. And my brothers tell me it's ridiculous. It will never happen. But the first time she built a Drupal site, she went home and told her mother, I can do it. I really can. And there's a phenomenal opportunity, especially with the technologies that we have today, to bring interns into your organization. And it's a benefit in twofold. One, it gives them real life work skills. It shows them a path. And you know, one of the things I'm passionate about is women and minorities in STEM. It opens the door to individuals that didn't see a path there for them or where people were telling them there is no path for you. So you can open that door even earlier. It reinvigorates your organization because you know these kids, they understand the technology. I mean, I, I did career day uh, with my second grader. Uh, they were eight-year-olds, and I asked all of them, "Can you imagine how you know a type of? Can you imagine a technology that might help solve a problem?" Every hand went up. Half of them have really good startup ideas already formed, and they're ready to go. So I think that you know, for organizations, I mean, in higher ed, it's a natural. It's the things that we've always done. We'll continue to do. Many of our other peer institutions do. But I'd highly encourage you know anybody else in government or commercial to really think about those internships, and that there's the new technologies now really lend themselves to making a success. Okay. As a follow-up to that as well, we have a, a Collide Center in McKinney that helps new companies grow. Uh, in the past, they would ask for storage and infrastructure. I would have to say over the last oh, 12 to, to 18 months, they're asking for wireless because they're doing all their stuff up into the cloud today. So I think that, uh, I don't know if I answered your question the way you wanted me to, but uh, I think that, uh, that it, it's the way things are moving. Everybody is moving up to the cloud, uh, either pu public or private, and um, it doesn't matter, you know, I, I would love to tell you that uh, we have programs in place for, for children to learn how to do Amazon and McKinney, but they could do it in McKinney, they, or they could do it in, in Cleveland, Ohio, or they could do it in, uh, in Minnesota. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it's very geographically unrestricted. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we're going to conclude. I'd like to thank Beth Ann and Chris uh, for participating today. Thank you all. And um, they'll be up here for questions. <laughs>